Hey everybody. Welcome to another evening walk with the mic. So, we might get a little extraneous noise. Mic brushing against the mask, this kind of thing. Maybe a little bit of other sound. The sound you hear in the background there is a fountain. It's an important fountain to me. I learned a lot from that fountain. It might sound like a strange thing at first, <laughs> but um, <laughs> the phenomenon around us and even the constructions humans make, they contain something that points toward what uh, Plato may have been meaning, depending on how we uh, think about the writings that have reached us from him. They contain, they are derivations of primordial forms. And maybe forms is the wrong word, um, because forms really implies structure. But what I mean is something more like character, nature, um, maybe even something resembling personality. And this fountain has helped me learn in many, many ways, some of them physical, because I used to practice uh, balancing on the curved edge of the lip of the fountain. And at first, you know, it's, it's hard to balance on top of a curved edge. Imagine if you bent a pipe into a circle, right? It can be difficult to balance on the top of a curved edge, particularly if the uh, surface is smooth. And this fountain has a smooth surface. And I'll talk more about the balancing in a moment, but um, <laughs> the construction of things like fountains, Ferris wheels, chandeliers, clocks, car tires. Imagine each of these things for a moment. Uh, water wheels. What else can, can we think of? What can you think of? Yeah. You can imagine a few things I haven't named. And it will be good if you do. And we see in these constructs primordial principles of numerism, relation, part and whole, masculine and feminine, plus and minus, bright and dark, slow and fast, drawing in, expressing out. All of these primordial features and all of the living beings uh, have the fingerprint of these primordial features uniquely embodied in each of them. Your own body is this way. Now balancing on the fountain was difficult at first, um, though I had been practicing Tai Chi for a while before I started trying that. Some time, in fact. I think I practiced for a year or two before it occurred to me that it would be useful for me to balance on the fountain and walk, walk the periphery of it. Um, and there's a little bit of danger because you can slip off, you could get hurt, you could fall in the water, you could look foolish in public. <laughs> but I very, very rarely slipped and never badly. Uh, though I practiced with that fountain for many years. And there's a reason why, I'm, there's a connecting thought here to what I will later discuss, which is that when I first began to balance and walk the periphery of the fountain, I'm going to take a wild guess that it's 30 feet in diameter. By the way, 
the old architects, there are buildings here, and they have the same principles, the old architects, right? They were aware of these principles and they embodied them. And they still do, but not in the way, it's uncommon these days for artisans and uh, specialized makers, skillful people, to know in any deep way what the principles were about. Though they might get taught principles of numerism, you know, cutting a circle and um, the relative dimensions of columns and how there's a kind of intrinsic numerism underlying that that's originally mystical. And I don't have time to go into why <laughs> all of these things are this way. <laughs> um, but there's a fine book called A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe that is certainly contains much of what I learned in terms of the, hmm, the explanatory knowledge, but the actual knowledge is not descriptive or explanatory. It's not methodological. It's intimate. If one encounters it, one encounters it intimately. Otherwise, it's merely intellectual, um, cognitive, and I, <laughs> I think we need a much deeper relationship with these matters than uh, we can get from descriptions and explanations. But this little book, A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, it's quite good. I recommend it. And it, it is a beautiful long vignette. There's a, there's a vignette about each of the numbers in the... Uh, not the decad, which is 10, but the appropriate word for 12, perhaps you know it, in Greek or Latin. Mm. So at first when I would walk around the fountain, uh, you know, I would watch my feet. In the beginning, I looked down at my feet. Uh, and I was a little bit shaky in the beginning. And then as, as time went on and I became more comfortable, I could look straight ahead and not have to watch my feet anymore. And I was more comfortable. Uh, and because I like to... <laughs> I like to see where, where, where a path can lead... The dog isn't hurt, it's just freaking out. Um, well, I mean, that could be a kind of injury, I suppose. <laughs> but not in the, uh, not in the yeah. physical sense. So, then after a while, I, I began to look up at the sky. <laughs> I wonder if this dog realizes just how far it's... Uh, its yelps will go. Oh, what it's actually concerned about is squirrels. It wants to chase squirrels. <laughs> I'll be approaching some people. So then the practice turned to looking at the sky as I circumambulated the fountain. Now, of course, walking in circles is by itself a very interesting thing. <laughs> so, one of the things the fountain taught me was the profound value of walking in a circle around something. Now, I had seen this previously, 
um, because when I watched Bagua practitioners, I often saw them attentively circling a tree with a particular kind of form. And I was not yet aware of the primordial signature, the fingerprint thing, though I had had some experiences with it. A few. Um, I'll save those stories for another time. But yeah, I was not really yet aware of... <laughs> I don't even know what to say, um, but something like that which the essence of the circle embodies, <clears throat> the principles, the character, the, <laughs> the knowledge, the intelligence, the nature of the circle, and the line, and the angle. Um, and as a human walking around a raised circle, <laughs> I'm an angle. <laughs> you know, look, looked at from the top, I'm a kind of weird shaped dot. There's the, uh, there's the owl. I think that was the female. Great horned owl. We call them. They probably just think of themselves as the people. <laughs> They're the people. They're the beings. They're the I'm listening for the answering call. So, Seen from the front or the side, right? I'm like a straight line standing up on the circle. And seen from the side, the flat circle on the ground is like a line. Can't tell it's a circle intrinsically. You might intuit it. But seen from the side, it just looks like a line. And this is very important, this idea. In fact, we should teach this to children before we teach them language. Things would go better <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> um, so then eventually, uh, and I don't remember the exact order how things developed, but there was the looking at the feet, the looking forward, the looking at the sky, which is certainly more difficult than looking forward. But again, also is a different kind of freedom a different kind of comfort, a different flavor of at ease in the circle walking. And then, you know, it came uh, going forward with my eyes closed. And again, I don't recall the precise order. Uh, and then I began to experiment with going backwards and kind of in the same way, right? Looking at my feet at first, looking forwards later, looking at the sky, then with my eyes closed. And I remember my old routine was uh, seven orbits forward, seven orbits backward seven orbits in one of the two directions with my eyes closed. 
That was an egret. So, that circle, that, that fountain and I, we have a long history and it's very good. And there's much more to say. It wasn't just walking with it. Mm. The sound of the fountain is very profound. And watching the light at play in the water is extremely profound. And I learned things about time, about light. And you know, when I first started this discussion about the fountain, I said, you know, it might seem strange to say I learned some things from watching a fountain, or I learned a lot of different things from spending time with a fountain, but any fascinated person will immediately understand what I'm talking about. Most of our famous physicists, well, some of our famous physicists were such people, right? Einstein was very curious. I think it was really his curiosity more than his technical flair that resulted in <clears throat> his discoveries. So it's only, it only sounds strange in common language, in the language of common norms and expectations and, <laughs> and children are playing with a, a feature that bars the road to the mountain across the moat. When I began to think about what to speak on, the first thing that came to mind was my history of interest in martial arts, which never began in earnest until, oh, I don't know, perhaps my early mid 20s. But then I realized there were more interesting topics than that though I may return to that topic, there are important features that I'd like to share with you about it. But then I realized that what I wanted to talk about was senses, faculties, abilities. See, when I first approached the fountain, I could barely balance. And it certainly did not then at that time occur to me that one day I would circumambulate that fountain backwards with my eyes closed, spinning a stick around my body. Compared to my first attempts to play with the fountain, the latter one is, if, if, if the beginning was crawling, the last one was flying. I learned to spin and change direction. I learned amazing things about the circle and how important one's angle on a situation is. Because each angle of the circle is a different place. And there are no static angles, right? Every micro angle is a new angle. And the circle taught me, walking around the circle taught me astonishing things about perception that I'd never imagined. And they were exciting and novel, inspiring. There's something alive in them. But you see, I did not know any of this when I first set foot on the circle. I only knew there was something interesting there. And I was drawn toward it. I felt drawn toward it. And that interest, that initial interest became a long, deep relationship where I learned many astonishing things I cannot hear catalog for you. 
though you might learn them yourselves if you cared to try a similar task. The point is that hidden inside me were abilities, faculties, and senses that I had never been introduced to. And in order to discover them, I needed a context. And I often speak about the idea that the thousands of faculties and abilities that humans have, perhaps the millions, perhaps the myriads, they are hidden inside us unless they are called forth by something. And so we think it astonishing when we see a young child singing their heart out on television, and truly it is. But it's primarily astonishing because we're not all doing it. Because we didn't develop those faculties ourselves yet. Though some of us may have. And the passion of young people is a very powerful asset in learning anything. Um, but that passion can be sustained and even deepened throughout our lifetimes. It was that passion that led me to the circle, and perhaps even to its origins. <laughs> but again, that's another story. So what I want to make clear, what I want to speak about, is that the senses and faculties that we have are truly profound, but most of them remained undeveloped, and so we do not taste them. And because we do not taste them, we go to sleep. And then, as we go to sleep, we uh, become kind of addicted to representations of them, to uh, the artifacts of modern culture. Film and food and drugs and alcohol and isolation and machines and smartphones and the internet, buying things, disposing of things. It's a tragic spiral that leads us away from our humanity into a kind of dead living. And please do not think I, I know nothing of dead living, for I know a great deal about it. <laughs> Most of us do. It's very lonely and isolating, and isolated. And the more we become isolated, the more inclined we are to continue down, sort of falling down the mountainside away from our interiority and humanity, the powers of our emotions and awareness, the the astonishing potentials of our human incarnation. Perhaps most tragic of all is the, the abject punishment we visit upon our children who arrive ready to develop these assets into seemingly impossible skills like holding one's breath for 20 minutes or climbing a snowy mountain naked, or being not only resistant to extreme cold, but welcoming and vital within it. To arts and practices, some developed by others, some awaiting our development, that we develop them ourselves. And no matter whether we subscribe to developmental paths that are traditionally conserved or whether we invent them, only in this way will we begin to discover what is <laughs> the incredible abundance of senses and faculties that are natural to our human form and that our distant ancestors were intimately familiar with and lived by and lived for and lived in and lived as. 
There's no story or description that will communicate this to you. Only going on the path yourself and developing one of the flowers, one of the seeds in your essence uh, will, will give you a taste of this. Though we can be encouraged by language and descriptions to set out, step up on the circle, find out where we come from, what our potentials are, what our roles can be as humans and as more than humans and as animals, because we are vastly more than merely human. And this is the problem with classes, thinking about things in classes and categories and sets. It's very useful. It's also extremely dangerous and blinding. And when I say you are so much more than human that all the stories ever written are not an iota of what and who you are and can become, I mean it. You could dispose of all of them and nothing would be lost because, not that we'd want to do that, but because you are, you are carrying the thing that is represented, the, 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 not the thing, you are carrying the potentials represented in those stories in a way completely unique and intimate to yourself that also, you know, shares properties with the other humans and the other animals and the living places and the sky and the stars and so on. And all of this is much more than any idea of human. And you are much more than ideas. When I say you can develop your senses, I mean things that, you know, we have all these, we have movies about people with astonishing abilities. We call them sometimes superheroes. And, uh, For example, in the recent Netflix series, uh, Daredevil, we find a blind martial artist with uncanny skills of sensing and hearing. And this seems a hyperbole, but it's actually a hypoboly. It is less than what we are, not more, less. You can learn to hear the heartbeat of a hummingbird. You can learn to know the mind of a person you're standing next to. You can learn to sense temperature gradients so subtle that without devices, humans would be absolutely confused at this ability. You don't just contain the sensing and ability knowledge of humans you contain the sensing and ability knowledge of primordial organisms, bacteria, animal cells, organs. And these abilities would shame science fiction and fantasy. But unless we are invited into a context <clears throat> where we can authentically explore and develop them, we're going to have a lot of trouble for all kinds of reasons. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons is that we'll get representations of them, right? Uh, we'll be sold some model or system, some description. some paradigm, some religion, some metaphysic. I'll tell you straight up, you don't need any of the explanations. You can set them all aside. Compared to what you're carrying, they're uninteresting. They're useless. What you are carrying, that is valuable. Your potentials, the assets you brought to human birth, that is valuable. The descriptions and models and for sale garbage you can dispose of all of it. Though, um, that said, 
there are paths that an insightful person can follow that will help greatly uh, because we need we need a reason <laughs> there, we, we have to have a purpose that draws us in and inspires us and then a context is very helpful now any living place is a beautifully great context but us humans we like other people we like we're social animals we want to learn and grow together and that's awesome and fun and beautiful I encourage it but part of the path will be traveled alone in one's interiority the only way to develop these things is to become fascinated or compelled right? and this is what we see in the people we remember as having discovered astonishing things usually they are both fascinated and compelled um, the man who introduced germ theory, perhaps his name is Semmelweis. Uh, if I recall the story correctly, his mother died of sepsis, giving birth to him. And when he saw uh, the surgeons assisting the birth mothers, <laughs> assisting is probably the wrong word here, with tools that earlier had been used to dissect corpses. And by the way, sepsis was, <laughs> sepsis was a terrifyingly common mode of death of young mothers and others, too, in his time. Perhaps the, uh, eh, I don't know the exact window, it's between 1750 and maybe 1870 or something. Um, anyway, you know, he was fascinated, he was, a, he was a doctor, and was compelled. His mother had died, he wanted to know why. And, you know, he figured it out. <laughs> he figured out that it wasn't a good idea to dissect corpses with surgical instruments unwashed, uncleaned, and then go delivering babies with those same instruments. <laughs> and um, so, you know, he did experiments like any reasonable scientist. And he discovered that the incidence of sepsis declined precipitously if the instruments were merely cleaned. And no one had ever thought to clean the skin right, either because they didn't have the idea that infections were caused by bacteria or, you know, viruses or fungi. So, you know, he was fascinated and compelled. And Lynn Margulis, who we credit appropriately with the discovery of the symbiogenic hypothesis of animal cells, meaning that um, the distinct components of the animal cells were once separate organisms that came together to form symbiotic unions. And before that happened, there were no animal cells, <laughs> i.e. no animals. Um, she was absolutely fascinated and compelled. Uh, her husband was Carl Sagan, a brilliant man in his own right. Her son, Dorian, is also the kind of person who I'd be likely to refer to with the word prodigy. I'm in danger of a, of a strong bird walk here. But um, because of that word prodigy, you see, it turns out that when we become fascinated and compelled, an aspect of our being that is more than human, older than human, and beyond all ideas awakens, and it recognizes its opportunity 
for expression and development. And if this does not happen, over time, this thing goes to sleep and we accept substitutes for it. Um, and in fact, we can become terrified of it. Uh, we can learn over time because we form habits. We kind of get into what we think of as grooves and we dig them deeper and deeper. The farther away from our prodigy we travel, the more difficult it may become to evoke it or invoke it. But it wakes up when challenged. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why you see people challenging themselves in various ways, because they want a taste of that nectar. Now, you know, without saying anything um, to, to denigrate the ordinary things that people do, things like running or working out with weights or something like this. Um, most of those things are insufficient to awaken our prodigy. They're a little too ordinary. And they don't... <laughs> their scope is too narrow. The scope of the fountain is everything. <laughs> That's the scope there. Now... With the fountain, however, it's very different from when I'm relating with a living place or living beings. The light on the water, on this lake that I'm walking around at the moment, for example. Uh, so there are narrow paths that we see people exploring around us. And some of them can be good. It really, you know, depends on who's doing it and why and how. Um, you can make profound use of almost any such path if you're in it in a deep way. Uh, but my point is that the really good stuff, what our prodigy is made for, actually, is an array of developmental paths and skills and assets that I associate with the origin of being and the origin of beings. And so, <laughs> the single most powerful motivating force is love. Adoration, wonder, awe. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. The snow geese in a long wing. <laughs> but there are other compelling motivations such as loss. Or even the sense of injustice. Not in, not, not in the form that... Um, is likely to result in the desire for vengeance. Um, but our, our hunger for justice in the form that expresses itself as the desire for, the, for deep understanding of the origins of the injustices that concern us. And this, you know, was at least part of what motivated Semmelweis, presuming I've got his name correct, um, to think about for his entire life with a burning question, what causes the infections? Why are all these women dying? Why are many of their babies dying? What is wrong? Now, of course, 
I believe, if I remember correctly, that Semmelweis's end was rather grim. Um, the surgeons and doctors were an elite male hierarchy class. And they were practiced in the perspective of if that were true, we'd already know it because we are the ones who know. <laughs> so they dismissed his ideas for a long time. And I believe he died in unfortunate circumstances in Bedlam or as Poe would say, or um, perhaps in an institution or he might have even died of sepsis. <laughs> um, He was not celebrated for his discovery until long after he died, but eventually his ideas took hold. Now, of course, the sanitization of things is both a grace and a problem as we have learned from our experience with antibiotics and hospitals. But you'd rather have that problem, well, it's not entirely clear. You would at least want the insight, whether you knew what, what to do, what wisely to do with it or not, the insight that surgical instruments have to be sterilized between uses. You definitely want this insight. And we got very confused by germ theory and started attacking our own microbiome and other things eventually. Um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a complex issue. What I wish to highlight, however, was it was his passion. He had a reason to need to know now, for some of us, death is enough of a reason. And we probably aren't going to get a good taste of it until someone or something that we love dies. Um, of course, someone could refer to our animal companions and plant companions and living places. <clears throat> That's what I meant. But death. is one of the great mysteries. And the big questions are, are very useful for me, you know. Why are there organisms? Do minds touch? What is light? What is time? How can I know more and more clearly and accurately and intimately about these matters of time and light and life? What is it that is recapitulated in the biologies of the reproduction of organisms. What is that dance about? Where did it start? Why are there men and women? Why is most of nature relatively binary? Physically. Or rather, why are most of the animal organisms relatively binary physically? What is this about? What does it mean to be a man? What can it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What can it mean to be a woman? Hmm. All of these questions. For a curious person, if you were given just one thing, say, a tree, <laughs> as long as you had light and you were alive and such, it would be enough for you to reconstruct the universe. So we have senses that we've never tasted. And sometimes um, these get lumped in under the uh, rubric of intuition, right? There's an animal nearby.
we uh, dismiss them too easily with words like intuition or instinct. And this allows us to feel that we've explained away the mystery because we have a word for it. Well, how much of what trees are does the word tree explain? How about none? <laughs> now, that's not entirely true because actually, if you look at the word, it's quite sophisticated. Language is far more sophisticated than we were trained to be able to understand. In each of the letters, there is a story, an array of stories, a manifold of stories. And when you put them together, those stories are transformed. And you can see in the word tree, a very complex encoding that carries with it unique aspects of the cognitive evolution of our species. You know, this first letter, <laughs> it is both a cross and that which holds things up, right? And the second letter, R, this can be understood to be referring to radiating, the way a tree's branches radiate. And this E can be understood in a variety of ways, but the simplest way of understanding it is energy transforming energy, T-R-E-E. -E. Um, now, these, this is a very simple toy of the situation. So there is something in the word, but very few of us will ever, are likely to, <laughs> to discover this, um, though we could teach each other these kinds of things. Um, and they are not literal things. It isn't that R means radiant. No, that's not how it is at all. R means different things in different contexts. But it, at the same time, has essential qualities. And what you're seeing, as I speak, is a little um, fragment of some of the knowledge that I became acquainted with in my own compelling fascination with the question, what is language? Why is there a language using animal like us on this world? Where did it come from? What does this mean? What might it mean? Where might it come from? Where could it come from? Right. A definitive answer is not as necessarily as valuable as speculations that lead us to broader perspectives, deeper perspectives, more intelligent perspectives, insightful perspectives. Because we're not going to come to a conclusion with any question. <laughs> a good question is a vehicle. And the vehicle transforms as you pursue it. But you don't abandon the vehicle with a conclusion. I don't have the answer to any question, though I can give a answer, <laughs> an answer. You were born to sense worlds you've never imagined could exist. And each one of us is like this. And others have said this in their own ways. Now, some people will say, yes, of course, you can uh, do a psychedelic drug and you will, you will have some non-ordinary experience. Eh? Well, it's not exactly untrue, but I mistrust it for various reasons and I have long experience with various drugs of this sort. Um, You are a non-ordinary being. Your nature is fundamentally not ordinary. 
at all. Your experience that is ordinary is the result of being circumcised, having the senses and faculties you were born with either severely inhibited, chopped off, entirely amputated, or transformed into some method of that allows you to relate with the structured cultures and societies you find yourself within. Now that gift by itself is very profound. Consider the human child's mind. It can normalize, no that's not the right word, it can adapt to any culture it finds itself in. Learn any human language, presuming the child is, you know, of good health and not in some way predisposed uh, to not be able to. But it can also learn animal cultures. It can learn plant cultures. It can learn insect cultures, fish cultures, bird cultures. And I strongly suspect and have good reason to believe that if we were born or taken to another intelligent, you know, another species not too dissimilar from our own, ones that, for example, either used language or a telepathic equivalent, I think the human child would develop those same skills. Um, I remember a story that I deeply believe, or rather, <laughs> I don't necessarily deeply believe the story, I believe the principle within the story. Um, a young indigenous girl and her father used to play a game. And the game was, you have to think of the word I have in my mind, and you have to get it right the first time. And if you do, I'll give you a piece of candy. And at first, the girl was frustrated and struggled, and things didn't work out. But eventually, she succeeded one time. And after that, it got easier. And after that, they had to invent a new game. Because otherwise, she'd have lost her teeth. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I don't have to claim any metaphysic or explanation for this. It's simply obvious to me that it is so. Minds can sense other minds, unless throughout their entire life they're told one of two things. Either that that's not possible, or that... or they're given some kind of phony, religious, culty, you know, plaything. Now, weirdly, even that kind of a thing could lead to the skill, but it's much less common than if things are honest and free of accoutrement, <laughs> decoration. <laughs> um, the unadulterated essence of our skills and our prodigy need no decoration. No decoration would befit them. And when I, when I speak about this prodigy, I mean something very mysterious, unique to each of us, but fundamentally alive in our interiority. It's that with which we sense and feel things. Right? And yet, this is just the shell of the prodigy. The shell has to break open and release what it's carrying for us to get a real taste of it. And I would like everyone to get a taste of that. And not only that, I think it's important that if we want to have an experience of the non-ordinary, that we begin in an authentic way and probably I would certainly prefer that that happen without the use of intoxicants because it's too easy to come to associate the use of intoxicants with the doorway to the non-ordinary and it is one door and it is a door with significant limitations. This is why you rarely find uh, people who have developed a deep understanding of the mind, you rarely find them recommending psychedelics. 
in the meditative traditions and so on. Now, someone will say, oh, well, Darren's against psychedelics. No, I'm not against psychedelics. I want people to have profound, non-ordinary experience endogenously, <laughs> right? Um, in a natural way, without having it suddenly forced on them by a drug, and this kind of thing, yeah? because there's all kinds of dangers with that other, other path. And some of them are very serious, and we can easily lose our way and, and come to think, you know, the drug is the door. You are the door. And once people have had endogenous non-ordinary experience, then perhaps they are uh, better prepared to cope with and make wise use of whatever might come from an intoxicant. Um. Now, of course, most people will have, many people anyway, will have a strange story or two of their life. A story where something that defies the structured representation of reality that we're taught and is mysterious in that sense. Uh, a moment of clear telepathy or a moment of precognition, a moment of prehension a moment of touching minds with another being, living place, or human, that we can, in listening to their stories, that, you know, we will find some that, that we just, we feel these are deeply authentic stories. They may have a confused explanation, but something non-ordinary took place. Um, love, and strangely, injustice, unexpectedly. Fundamental curiosity is extremely useful in the path. Now, the way that I came to this topic was thank you. I'm used to walking in darkness, and uh, I've just come to a stairwell, and someone ascending the stairs as I descend them had a flashlight. And I think they reasonably thought that it would be a kindness to light my path. Um, but what they didn't realize is I had been walking in darkness, and so by lighting my path, they were blinding me. <laughs> Because you see, my eyes had adjusted to darkness. This is another thing, right? In uh, one of Carlos Castaneda's books, well, it may, it may have been a book by one of the witches, actually. Could have been Florinda Donner, Taisha Abelar, uh, who was the other one? Kylie someone? No, there was a third one, I can't remember, but... In one of the books, uh, one of the, the women who describe themselves as witches, in, you know, with an asterisk, right, as castanade in witches, um, they talked of learning to run in the wilderness in darkness. Now, who would imagine that such a thing is possible or reasonable? Well, it is. I practiced it. It can be done. And this is what I mean when I say we have so many senses, abilities, potentials, that unless we are, unless we pursue them ardently on our own, <clears throat> or are accidentally introduced to them, uh, many of us would not even believe in them. We would say, no, that's just a bunch of nonsense. That's some metaphysical gobbledygook someone made up, so on and so forth. Um, I read a story. I may have mentioned this in a previous video, but I'll briefly mention it again. A reporter was sent to uh, document, to write a piece on the birth of a 
baby dolphin at a local aquarium and this guy was quite upset about the assignment because he just he doesn't think he's incapable of thinking of animals as beings right he just thinks of them essentially as <laughs> objects that can move or something which is a pretty common thing for most people you know they they know what the class of animal essentially or basically refers to but they don't know <laughs> what's behind that reference. So anyway, he went to the aquarium, smoked a bunch of cigarettes, drank a bunch of coffee, was pissed off. Um, the aquarium people came around the tank and the little baby dolphin who was six weeks old was uh, just staring at him. And then the people left, I guess, and he was there by himself smoking a cigarette. This was back when you could smoke inside aquariums, apparently. Um, Anyway, he, he took a drag of his cigarette and, and being annoyed at the, at the intense attention of the baby dolphin, he, he turned toward it and blew the blue smoke in its face, you know, at the glass. Right? And the baby dolphin stared at him intently for a moment. You know, he was pissed. He was essentially telling him, like, go away, you know. So the baby dolphin hung out for a moment and intently observed him and then it disappeared for a bit, and when it came back, it sort of tapped on the glass, and as he turned toward it, it blew smoke in his face at the glass. The dolphin had gone to its mother, secured a mouthful of milk, <laughs> and demonstrated to the man that it could understand his signal and even reproduce it. This is a creature who's been on Earth six weeks. Well, that individual creature, anyway. <laughs> um, that moment changed that man's life forever because a fundamental principle of his sleep, right, of his unconsciousness about organisms was penetrated irrevocably. It just disappeared. And then it was safe for his prodigy to adjust his perspective. Now we can't know exactly what happened inside the man or the dolphin, but the story is a brilliant one because it shows a barrier being destroyed, a barrier to awareness, a barrier to being. If you can't tell that the living beings around you are intelligence, you will think they are just things. And if the world turns into just things, then you yourself are a thing an object, a commodity, and so is your time and effort and heart and so on, which is a, just simply a really ugly way to be. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. A miserable way to be. Our prodigy may be bold or it may be timid. Each one is, of us is unique and we're different in different life phases. But it wants expression. And it has the capacity for senses that defy the sum of everything we've ever believed possible. And that's why people occasionally show us, right? They're like, look, you can, you can hold your breath for 20 minutes. You know, if you work at it. You can climb a frozen mountain in shorts. <laughs> Not that these are the right kinds of things to do, but just they're examples of stuff we, we think of as impossible or amazing, <clears throat> but it's only because most of us are asleep and our faculties are hidden from us, for we have never or rarely been in contexts that support their emergence and development, their discovery. Together we can form these contexts, and even in this talk, this is such a context, right? Because by speaking of these matters, we are encouraging each other and supporting each other in pursuing them, if we care to. Now the reason that I got to this topic from, from thinking of my martial arts training was that I didn't study martial arts, this is going to sound a little strange to many martial artists, but not to all. 
I didn't study martial arts to learn how to fight. I don't fight. It isn't that I wouldn't or that I can't. I suspect I'm relatively as capable as the next guy, so to speak, and maybe a bit more due to my long training. But I did not learn martial arts to fight. I learned martial arts because I wanted to understand principles. And for this reason, I chose Tai Chi. Though I'm, all, I'm also um, fascinated with other internal martial arts, Xing Yi, Bagua, Yi Chuan. So these arts, though they uh, can be applied to fighting, um, they, some or all of them have deeply Taoist origins. Some of them originated um, perhaps in monasteries. I've heard stories of Buddhist monks being exterminated and uh, developing martial arts skills um, in order to survive in China and perhaps Japan as well and other places, the Philippines and so on. <clears throat> but what Tai Chi gave me, well, one of the many gifts Tai Chi brought to my life and continues to bring, is the context in which to explore the non-ordinary. Not just intellectually, physically, right? Everyone does martial arts for different reasons. But most of my teachers were very concerned with uh, the mind, the relationship between the mind and the body, and how to develop extreme sensitivity. Because form won't preserve you in a crisis. You need much more than form. You need, you need sensitivity, relaxation, and the capacity to improvise instantly. Forms teach us principles, um, but the principles must be exceeded just the same way a jazz musician exceeds whatever their knowledge of, say, classical music might be. So I was lucky in that I was able to make of Tai Chi a vehicle um, for learning in many dimensions that have nothing to do with fighting, that have to do with the nature of consciousness, my body, health, um, various capacities of the mind and the body that are otherwise invisible to us and truly look supernatural and feel supernatural when we experience them directly. So I was able to make of that path a very broad vehicle and it was, it was and remains deeply compelling and infinitely deep in terms of what one can learn from it. Uh, and again, we don't have to decide whether this means there's mysticism or not. It's simply a fact that a guy I know can sense where you're going to move before you move. And if you don't think so, you can try and see. And even very skillful advanced people who don't think so have tried and saw. <clears throat> and it's not because he's a magician. It's because he's awake. 
And his prodigy has a way to express itself in his body, in his movement, in his relationships, and in his life. And it has a few ways, but this is one of them. And so it may be important for, for many of us to have some vehicle, yeah, so that as we invest in the vehicle and become invested in the vehicle, our prodigy finds a safe place that won't destroy its social life or its capacity to have a job or, you know, all these other things. Right? A survivable place where it can emerge and, and be experienced and develop without scaring the natives off. <laughs> so when I was thinking of my martial arts history, I realized suddenly, ah, yeah, this was a good vehicle. And then I wanted to talk instead about faculties and potentials and senses, roles. You see, when we, when we do something, we acquire a role. If I write, I begin to become writerly. You know, when I see other martial artists, they may realize I'm not a fighter. That does not cause them to disrespect my, my learning. They know they could probably take me. That's not the issue. <laughs> That's not... That's not why, why we're in the game. And also, they are aware, most of them, that there are deep paths uh, that go far beyond fighting into something we don't really have good language for in the West. And, you know, many might call it mysticism, and it's okay with me if they do, but we don't have to call it anything. What I want is for us to have an experience of it hopefully together, <laughs> because it gets very lonely chasing insight by oneself, unless mm, unless the context is fundamentally communal in the sense that one senses the communality of all beings and the beings nearest us and the beings we are with in the moment. <laughs> Pure, undifferentiated potential. It's a beautiful phrase. The power to become before it has become anything. This is an idea implicit in uh, Tai Chi. And the, the practice of Tai Chi and similar internal martial arts, we're usually called this, is a very unusual thing. It's a non-ordinary thing. We learn about the insides of our bodies in ways that are otherwise simply inaccessible to us, and of capacities of our fascia and muscles and bones and tendons that would be very, very shocking if sudden, someone suddenly showed us them. Because for a well-trained person, an insightful person, they can move your body <laughs> with a fingertip. They can move your whole body with a tiny, tiny amount of force by sensing how you are uh, in your body and how you are in your balance, right? So they develop what to common people would certainly appear to be extrasensory perception. Is it actually extrasensory? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about that question. It's not interesting. The fact of the practice is interesting. The fact of the existence of this kind of ability is fascinating. 
And some of those who I would talk to, including some of the most skillful, will say very, very directly, there's nothing metaphysical about it. It's just practice and sensitivity. But I get rather suspicious when humans use this word just, because they don't know either. <laughs> and if you, if you press them, they'll tell you, well, actually, I don't know for sure. But we don't need that is kind of what they're saying. We don't need those noises. What we need is the senses. And this is part of what I meant by no one will describe the path to you in such a way that it will open for you. It's like, it's like a mission or a quest, right? Or a puzzle. You have to resolve it personally. Um, and by resolve, I don't mean finish. I mean proceed. You know? make, make some progress. Something like this. So, <laughs> these are my thoughts for the evening on my night walk. And I'm very grateful for those of you who listen. I wish you every blessing of origin, of life, of the living places, of the animals, of the season, of the plants, all the living beings. May your path be deep and beautiful, your life long and prosperous. Bye-bye for now. Hope to see you again soon.